Hey, welcome to The Protectors. Absolutely amazing guest today. I'm really excited to have Larry on. Great thing is Larry and I met at SHOT Show 2020. We actually met via email and everything before that, but Larry was on the other end. He was interviewing me for SHOT 2020. Yeah. So uh, welcome, Larry. How are you? And then Great. also, before you get there, I forgot to mention, welcome to my awesome co-host, Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, and, and it's now, nice Larry, back, apologize. I can't, I can't forget about Kelsey. But uh, Larry, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming well, it's on. It's great. Today. It's great to be with you, Kelsey and Jason. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's good to see you again. Uh, it's great to see you too. And I'm glad that you're on because a lot of people were up in the air like, what's going on with SHOT 2021? And then also there's so much going on with the gun industry right now and the firearms industry that we really should just jump right into it about right. this massive influx of new gun owners, yeah. new hunters, new everybody is like, I can't even imagine if you could just touch on it on the state of the industry right now, that'd be great. Well, it's... Uh it's really been incredible. It really started at the beginning of the year, but uh, took off in uh, mid to late March when the whole COVID pandemic, uh, you know, and shelter in place started. People got very concerned when you heard stories about, you know, the police not arresting people, prosecutors saying we're not going to prosecute criminals, and then prisons letting violent criminals out back onto the street. So people got very concerned, food insecurity and things like that. And then you had the whole George Floyd situation and the aftermath of that, you know, not the peaceful protesting, but the rioting and looting that uh, continues to go on in places like Seattle and Portland and elsewhere. Um, so we've seen record sales for the industry, um, you know, uh, unprecedented increases uh, year over year for March, April, May, June, July, all record months, you know, um, Astronomical increases, 95% for the year so far. Ammunition is up 135 or so percent. And I don't see it stopping. And you know, the primary reason people are buying is for self-protection because they're concerned about you know this whole defund the police movement, that the police aren't going to be there to protect you. You see what happened in Seattle with this um, chap and the whatever they call it, the CHOP, and I guess they changed the name um, halfway through. Very disconcerting. So, so people are, you know, taking advantage of the fact that we have a Second Amendment and are buying guns for self-protection at record numbers. And as you mentioned, you know, our survey from a little while back indicates that since the beginning of the year, 40% of the people at the checkout counter are first-time gun buyers. And of that 40%, which is about, that's, through May was 2.5 million, so it's, it's clearly more than that now. Um, of that 40%, 40% of those folks were women who were first time gun buyers. And you know we've seen a trend over time, but it's been very demonstrable the last several months, is that the demographics of the buyer are changing. So this stereotype that the media portrays that the only people who own guns are a bunch of old middle-aged fat balding uh, rednecks from the south um, is just not true uh, we see we, we saw particularly early on in the, the pandemic asian americans in record numbers buying firearms and now you see a lot of african americans buying firearms for the first time and we've seen you know quotes by like the head of the National Association of African-American Gun Owners saying, you know, the days of kumbaya are over and we're going to protect ourselves. You know, the Second Amendment is colorblind, just as the First Amendment is, right? So people, law-abiding citizens have the right to protect themselves and, and they are doing so in record, record numbers. You know, it's just, it's breathtaking. This will clearly be the highest year for sales in the history of the industry, surpassing 2016. That'll happen probably next month, you know, um, you know, in, in August, at the end of August. If not, it'll be September. We're going to surpass all of 2019 next month. We're you know, just a little short of that um, benchmark, if you will. So, and I don't think it, uh, sales are going to 
uh, you know, back off, at least through the election. And we predict that it will continue right on past the election, no matter who wins. Yeah, sales are amazing. One thing that it really touched on me was I've been in LEO for 20 something years now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my friends, you know, and I love guns. I love firearms. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a flintlock to an air, uh, an air gun to a anything. I, I love it. But the thing is I'm finding a lot of my LEO like partners and friends uh, from other agencies even as well are going out and buying ARs, mm -hmm. you know, and buying right. just anything they can. And they're having a, a heck of a time right now trying to find ammo, uh, a heck of a time trying to find an AR-15 right. and just trying to just, because a lot of it comes. And one thing it really hits is the family. And a lot of these new gun owners, and this isn't just LEOs, a lot of new gun, gun owners mm -hmm. as a whole want to protect their family. And one thing that NSSF is really focusing on right now is, okay, you're a new gun owner. 40% right. sales are up. When, you know, a lot of these new gun owners, the reason they bought that gun was to protect their family. Right. And that family comes with a lot of young children. So that's where um, NSSF has Project Child Safe, which is something that really caught my eye when I first started hanging and talking with you guys. Can you touch on that? Sure. Well, as you mentioned, you know, firearm safety is paramount, right? People are motivated by protecting their family themselves. That's the primary motivation that, that you know, for buying now. And so we want to make sure that you, you know, what you're protecting your family and you don't have, you know, an, a horrible accident, right? I mean, you have a right to own a firearm, but it comes with responsibilities. You have to be a safe and responsible firearms owner. And that means you have to secure your firearm, uh, you know, from unauthorized use, you know, when you're not using it. And there are many, many ways of doing that. And, you know, every firearm sold today uh, comes with, a, you know, a lock. A locking device, and we, we kind of call it lock in the box. Uh, retailers, of course, have locking devices. They have to have locking devices for sale in their store. Uh, and firearm safety education, and you know, there's information in the owner's manual. But above and beyond that, you know, we've made a real focus during these past uh, several months to encourage retailers to reach out to these new gun owners, their new customers, and and you know, we've been communicating to these new gun owners as well. And as you mentioned, one of the more key programs of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is now over 20 years old, is Project Child Safe. And Project Child Safe, you know, we partner with law enforcement agencies all across the United States, over 15,000 law enforcement agencies. You know, we, we run the program in every single state in the country uh, and every U.S. territory. And we have provided over 38 million firearms safety education kits that includes a free cable style gun lock uh, and, you know, to preach the gospel of being a responsible firearms owner and making sure that when your firearm is not in use, it's stored you know, uh, to make it uh, inaccessible to unauthorized users. Whether that's a young child in the house or whether it's you know, maybe a you know, family member who's depressed or despondent might be suicidal, or even if somebody breaks into your house, you know, they, they can't steal the gun. And of course, as you know, there are you know, many, many ways of achieving that. There's no firearm ever made that can't be secured in some way. You know, we provide a cable lock because it's pretty much universal uh, and also requires the gun, the action to be unloaded in order to install the cable lock. But, you know, there are, you can have a safe, you can have a, a quick access lockbox. They, you know, there can be keys, combinations, biometrics on safes. The, the important thing is not how you do it, but that you do it. And you have to be a responsible gun owner. That is so critical. And the important thing for people to know is that through the course of the years that, again, two decades of Project Child Safe and other efforts, you know, like I said, the industry members providing locks in the box for decades now. Fatal firearms accidents are at their lowest level since record keeping began in 1903, both in total numbers and as a per capita number. And we're really proud of that. Now, one is too many, and we're not, we're going to continue the program. You know, uh, we've been fortunate to have grant funding in the past from DOJ under the Bush administration. We even got a grant from the Obama administration. And you know, we, we received grants from the Veterans Administration uh, to keep the program going. We have a grant from Governor Abbott in Texas. But throughout 
which is all wonderful, throughout the entire course of, of, of doing Project Child Safe, it's been funded by the industry because firearm safety education is critical for our industry. I mean, there's nobody supports firearm safety education more than the industry itself. So critically important. And if, if one of your listeners you know, doesn't have a locking device, maybe they bought a used firearm or, or they or, you know, inherited one or something, you can probably call your local police department and ask them if they have Project Child Safe locks. And if they don't, tell them to call us and we'll get them locks. I love that. I think that's incredibly important. Just like you said, safety, one is too many and safety is of the utmost importance, especially education. A lot of new gun owners, you know, are saying, okay, what do I do now? How do you unload and load a weapon? How do you clear a malfunction? How do you operate it? Most importantly, to secure our children and, you know, those assets in terms of safety. So I think that's wonderful what you guys are doing. In terms of education, where's a starting point? Would that be your website in terms of to, to just be more educated and kind of get yeah, filled in? Well, you could start with going to projectchildsafe.org um, for information. You can go to the nssf.org website, and we've got a whole section on our website about firearm safety education, various videos and publications you can download and print. And I would also say, importantly, your local firearms uh, retailer that you purchased the firearm from, or even if you didn't, you know, and you got it elsewhere, go and see them. They can help you, um, teach you, they can train you, uh, help you get a safety education course, or your local shooting range. One of the things we did early on uh, in the, the pandemic was to work to make sure, uh, with Homeland Security, to make sure that retailers could stay open so that people could acquire firearms uh, to protect themselves, including law enforcement, as, as many people don't realize this, and you guys do, obviously, is that most law enforcement agencies and officers acquire their firearms and ammunition from their local gun store. You know, this idea that like Smith & Wesson or Glock just ships all the guns to the local police station isn't true, right? So, um, so it was important to keep retailers open and as important was to keep ranges open so that people could go and learn how to safely use the firearm in a safe environment and get training. And as you're probably aware, firearm safety education training classes that any new gun owner I would recommend taking are you know, booked you know, well into the fall. And, and that's an indication, of course, of there are new gun buyers, right? So I always uh, analogize it to like, when you learn to drive as a teenager, you do, probably almost certainly took a driver's ed course, right? Uh, but the second, you, know, you bought your second car, you didn't take driver's ed again, right? So these are, this is, you know, real evidence that there are all these new gun buyers out there. And it's a pattern we've seen in the past when there have been spikes and rising new gun owners, that these you know, introductory level firearm safety education courses uh, are in packed, you know, which is a a great thing, but I, that's critically important. You know, there's lots of education out there. And I would say, you know, you can also go talk to one of your friends that's a gun owner. I, I don't, you know, the number of gun owners who aren't safe and responsible is, is really, really small. We want that to be zero. And that's what we strive for, of course. But there's, there's lots of education out there. Take advantage of it. And gun owners love to talk to people about guns, right? So, so they'll be happy to help you. So you, you, bring, like, you bring up a good point. I'm always ready to talk about guns. And that's the thing is like, <laughs> I recently started getting my certification so I could, I could teach basic pistol and CCW. And the classes are sold out everywhere. Right. It's all wait list. And that does show yeah. you. Um, so I go to the basic course to get, because um, you take the basic course in order to become an instructor. And 90% of the people in there have never held a firearm before. And you could tell it doesn't matter regardless of their political party or political affiliation. They were all there like for the same reason, just to learn the basics. Not that they're going to carry it every day and maybe they'll just keep it in their nightstand. Be safe. Right? Yeah. And like people from like 21 to like, it looked like 81 were there. So right. absolutely right. amazing. Yeah. And again, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I tell people, you want proof of the demographics are changing, just go to a shooting range on a weekend. 
and you'll see people of all colors, creeds, races, political persuasions. It doesn't matter. The Second Amendment is colorblind. The other thing I really wanted to touch on today is because, you know, you do work with law enforcement. Um, you've been working with ATF for a long time in order mm -hmm. to, you know, work on the facilities themselves, like the, the gun, um, the firearm stores facilities right. to get them secure. But the other huge thing is fix NICS. NICS yeah. is a national, national instant uh, criminal background check system, NICS. And right now what that is, and you could ex definitely explain a lot yeah. better than, than me, but the thing is, a lot of states are not reporting to the FBI everything that they should be. So let's get into that and how we can, sure. as a community of protectors, how we could address that. So it's a fix Nix was an initiative started by the National Shooting Sports Foundation after Sandy Hook. When we realized that many states, too many states, were not reporting all of the disqualifying records to the, the FBI Nix center in West Virginia that runs the background checks. And often this was because of state privacy laws. Sometimes it was just, you know, no lack of political will or direction. And the, the chief or the main record that wasn't being submitted was uh, mental health adjudications where somebody was determined by lawful you know, due, with due process found to be involunt involuntarily committed to a mental health institute or adjudicated to be, as the Gun Control Act says, mental defective, right? Meaning dangerous to themselves or others. And so under federal law, they're a prohibited person. But all too often, and this was really highlighted again, sadly, by Sutherland Spring shooting, these records were not being put into the system. NSSF, on our own, the firearms industry, nobody else, went uh, and got the law changed in 16 states to put these records in to the next system, again, cheaply disqualifying mental health records. And I'm not talking doctor's notes, right? And, you know, but just the piece of paper from the court or the, you know, government, you know, process that said, you've been adjudicated mentally defective or you've been involuntarily committed. And so we, through our effort in changing the law in 16 states, have increased the disqualifying mental health records going into next by over 240 percent since 2013. Now we still have more work to do and we continue those efforts. There are still three states um, that don't report at all, New Hampshire, Montana, and Wyoming, but we continue to work on those efforts. We made really good progress in Wyoming last year and we're, we're committed to continuing that effort. Um, and then the Sutherland Springs came along uh, and here was a this individual was um, this uh, prohibited person about four different ways, right? He was, he was uh, uh, dishonorably discharged. He had a felony conviction. He'd been, in, he'd been put in a mental health facility. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, it, he, he was in the Air Force. They weren't putting the records in. Turned out that nobody, any of the uniform branches in the DOD were putting the records in. Sadly, we came to learn that the FBI was aware of this. And didn't do it, you know, didn't really didn't pursue getting it changed. And so we talked with Senator Cornyn's office, and he introduced the fix Nix legislation, and it passed with broad bipartisan support that requires the federal government agent, you know, law enforcement agencies, DOD, to put those records in, and they are now going in. And it also created grant funding to the states to really supplement our efforts to, you know, make sure the states had funds available to get those records in. And President Bush, or I'm sorry, President Trump signed the Fix Nix legislation. And, and the bill is called the Fix Nix Act. And that's not a mistake. It was named after our program, you know, and uh, it was a great bipartisan victory. It's not gun control. We hear sometimes from some groups, even pro-gun groups that think somehow Fix Nix is, you know, gun control. It's not. We're not interested in expanding who is a primitive person. We just want the records in the system because our retailer members, federal licensees, rely upon that information to be accurate. You know, when they do a background check, when somebody fills out the form, the form 4473, and then goes the background check, and and Nick says proceed, they want to know that it's accurate. They're not turning the gun over 
to somebody who's a felon or somebody who's you know dangerously mentally ill. You know, I'll give you one, there's time, I'll give you one quick example of where this, this is a real life example of where this matters. So remember the couple of years ago, the Washington Navy Yard shooting happened, I think 2013 or so. Terrible incident. That individual, you know, purchased a Remington pump shotgun from a retailer in Virginia and then committed that horrific crime murder at the Washington Navy Yard. It came out uh, through the investigation that shortly before he had been in Rhode Island on a work assignment and the police were called to his motel room because he was acting strange, et cetera. Turned out pretty clearly he was paranoid schizophrenic. He was taken to an emergency room. For whatever reasons, he was not involuntarily committed in Rhode Island and he was released. But even if he had been, Rhode Island at the time was not submitting the records to the NICS system. We were working a fixed NICS bill in Rhode Island at that very time. And the legislature said, we're not going to pass this. We're going to go do a study. Uh, and it was really, you know, kind of like that's how you kill a bill, just send it off to be studied instead of dealing with the merits of the argument. When we found out what happened, we went back to the legislature and said, look, he would have been able still to go back and pass that background check and commit the horrible crime he did because you don't put the records in. They passed the legislation within 24 hours of us having that meeting. And I'm really proud of that. It just shows it makes a big difference. It would have made a difference in that case. It would have stopped him. I 100% agree with you. That is, it, and the fact that this is coming from the gun community, it's right. not coming from inside our government. It's not coming, which it should come from, in my opinion, it should come from people that hold more values toward stronger gun control, which you find on both sides of the coin. You find that on the conservative based side and the, you know, liberal side, depending upon, I know we don't talk politics mm -hmm. too much, but you know, these are, these are fundamental values that Americans have. And so I commend you and the organization for being a part of the gun community and then also wanting more accountability um, and, and actually taking efforts and steps to do that um, because that's what we need, you know, and we need that on yeah. both sides of the coin, wherever you stand, that's an American policy. Well, you know, thank you for that. And, and you know, I've said many times about the fixed NICS initiative and the legislation, it, it, it shows that there can be common ground there. You know, people focus on what they disagree about instead of trying to find where there's common ground and, and building on that and creating a dialogue of trust, right? We're not, we're not going to surrender our beliefs on the second amendment, but there, you know, there are incremental changes that everyone can agree on that do in fact, you know, as we say, real solutions for safer communities, you know, and, you know, and Fix Nix is a great example of that. Imagine if the records from DOD had been in there, that individual in Southern Springs would not have been able to pass a background check. And he did it not once, but four separate times because the records weren't there. I mean, it's really a failure of our government, honestly. Um, yeah. And, you know, General Mattis was the head, uh, you know, former Marine, uh, was the head of uh, Secretary of Defense at the time, and I've heard he was just, you know, not a happy camper when he found out. And he ordered that they get those records into the system immediately. Would that be, you know, before the legislation was passed? We saw federal law enforcement agencies were not putting the records in, chiefly among them uh, ICE, who's probably the worst offender. And, and it was not a willful, but it was a resource issue. So... Nick Fix Nix provided more resources to get that done. So Absolutely. really, really proud about it. Well, good. And I'm so glad that um, that you guys are actually taking efforts and educating the public about that. Um, we need more awareness in terms of that. And we need solution-based resources like what you're presenting. I would 100% support that. And the other thing I wanted to ask you in terms of making um, efforts and change with the state of everything that's going on right now with coronavirus and everything like that, how does that look for you guys in terms of planning for SHOT 2020? I know a lot of companies and things like that that are planning right now, but a lot of us want to, you know, figure out yeah. well, how do you plan? What are you planning? <laughs> you know? Well, I, I will tell you, we get that question all the time. 
And I like to remind people, look, we've been dealing with COVID for about four months, right? Shots are six months away. Look at how much the world has changed, you know, in four months. No one can say today what conditions will be in January. So right now, you know, NSSF is planning full steam ahead. The, you know, the SHOT Show is going to happen unless the government says it can't happen. So SHOT Show is, it, it, we're going forward. Now, you know, we presume there will be, you know, requirements that we'll have to meet um, because of the situation. So, you know, mat, you know, masks, we'll have hand sanitizers, there'll be, you know, one-way aisles um, to control traffic flow. We'll have to probably almost certainly control um, for social distancing. We're working on all those things, working with, you know, with the city um, and, and the county and our, you know, our partners, the Sands um, and Caesars Forum. As you know, Chacho is expanding into Caesars Forum. So we're gonna, it's gonna be the largest show ever in terms of exhibitors, and we've sold, you know, you know, essentially 100% of the space. So, um, you know, the SHOT Show is, is, you know, people should assume the SHOT Show is going forward because unless Governor Sisolak says you can't, we're, we're going to go forward and have the show. And we're going to but we're going to be safe and responsible uh, and take care of our employees, our exhibitors, and our attendees. You know, we, obviously. So, you know, just the other day, Las Vegas, um, Convention and Visitors Bureau sent a letter to us saying, you know, they they thanked us for continuing to plan for Shot Show. That, that uh, you know, our industry and our show is is important to the city. You know, we bring a lot of you know, tax revenue to the city, and you know, and they are committed, and, and as are all our partners, the Sands, the, et cetera, the Venetian, Palazzo. Uh, you know, to have a successful show and to make sure that we're safe and res responsible and keeping everybody healthy. So, you know, <laughs> registration has open. On with the show. We're going. <laughs> it's on. It is on. Larry, I'm so Don't glad believe you know. in the naysayers. It's, it's happening unless the government says you can't. Larry, I really appreciate you coming on. I love talking guns. I love talking firearms industry. And I, I really, really support what NSSF is doing. Um, one thing for the audience out there I really want to push is that there's so many different initiatives. Uh, one of them is a plus one, bring a friend yeah. shooting, bring a friend hunting. Um, the hashtag, let's go shooting, let's go hunting. There's so many things that you're doing that are just yeah. different than politics. A lot of people are like, hey, you know what? Yeah. I got a gun, I want to go hunting, or I got a gun, I want to go shooting. Let's do it. So that's really cool what the NSSF is doing. Yeah, you can, you know, if you want to find a place to go shooting, where you want to find a place to go hunting. And, and by the way, August is National Shooting Sports Month. So we're really encouraging everyone to go to a range and bring a friend. That's kind of the whole plus one campaign for hunting and target shooting um, is to, you know, bring, encourage somebody who's never done it before to give it a try. Uh, national, so if you go, you know, take some pictures, put them on your social media, hashtag National Student Sports Month. You know, we got a proclamation from President Trump in support of uh, National Student Sports Month. And I think a dozen or more governors have issued proclamations as well uh, in support of National Student Sports Month. So we're, that's a big initiative for this month. But, you know, you can go to, um, if you Google, wherever you are in the country, you can go to uh, step outside, uh, and there's a website where you can find places to go, you know, hiking, kayaking, archery, but also hunting and target shooting, and we support that. But, or, you know, you go to our website, and you can find uh, hunting preserves, and you can find ranges, uh, retailers, everything you need. But I, I strongly encourage everybody, you know, bring somebody with you, introduce somebody to the fun uh, of the sport of target shooting or hunting. You know, that's the whole one plus movement. You know, oh, it's, it's incredible, Larry. That's how I got introduced. We were talking before the show. That's how I got introduced to hunting and fishing after the Marine Corps. And, you know, I'm brand new to the industry. Um, and I just love it. Hunting and fishing is a huge part of my heart now and um, a big part of my therapy, my personal therapy. I do it with my daughter and I enjoy it very much. Right. And I would have never known unless it was for my girlfriend, Leslie, who works with Heroes Outdoor Therapy. That's her nonprofit. And she invited me out 
um, to get into the industry. And so it's been amazing ever since. And um, I definitely encourage people to go out there and use your plus one to um, bring someone out. Um, on that note, in terms of outdoor therapy, so to speak, you guys are a huge um, uh, supporter of that movement, you know, veterans with post-traumatic stress or people in general who want to just get outdoors and find kind of a new, a new outlet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And my question to you on that note is, where do you see, where do you see things going in the future for like, we talked about new gun owners and bringing people out into um, the outdoors, hunting and fishing. Where do you see the community heading in the next like 10 years? Um, and do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're going to continue uh, these initiatives to, to bring new people uh, to our sport, to hunting, uh, through, through programs like Plus One, particularly on the hunting side, it's so important. You know, all the research shows that, you know, to get somebody involved in hunting, you know, they, they need a mentor. If you've never hunted before, you know, like, how are you going to, like, you can't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go turkey hunting. You wouldn't have a clue what to do, what you need. So that mentoring is so important. And it used to be, you know, father to son, grandfather to son, you know, that is so much more difficult these days because you know, everybody's pressed for time. And so mentoring, very important, particularly on the hunting side. Shooting, you know, you can go to a range, you can get, take class, you know, uh, and they're, you know, they're typically very welcoming. You know, they have like, you know, ladies nights and, and things like that. So um, it's, you know, and it's critical that we engage all of these new gun buyers out there. And again, it's, you know, crazy numbers, 40%. This year of, of all purchases for first time buyers as we've talked, but this has you know, been going on for a while. It used to be like back in like say 2012 to 16, you know, it was about 25%. Uh, of re retails would tell us it'd be between 20 and 25% with first time buyers. So, it, you know, it's engaging them, you know, don't just buy the gun and put it in your dresser drawer and leave it, right? Like right. certainly if you do that, make sure it's locked and, and unload it and, you know, if you're not using it, but and be responsible. But we, you know, we want these people to come out, participate um, in target shooting. And, you know, women are among the fastest growing segment of the market. Absolutely. You see that at the SHOT Show, you walk around the SHOT Show, you'll see, you know, products that are specifically designed for women. They're not simply, you know, youth models, you know, uh, in pink camo, right? Like it's, they're actually designed by women for women. Um, and you see a lot of that now. So it just reflects how yeah. important it is to the, you know, to the industry. Larry, let me ask you one more thing. I think that was wonderful because especially mentioning women, me as a new, as a woman new in this industry, hunting, fishing, and getting further into shooting and whatnot. Um, I found it oddly shocking that the industry hunting and fishing and what, and especially shooting is it seems as though it's uh, discriminated against and I couldn't believe it. I had no idea. And a lot of people in the community were like, you don't know this, this is like commonplace. Like it's like, yeah. it's, it's almost hard, you know? And I, I find that sad because I want to promote um, the growth that I've had through fishing, hunting and shooting, you know? And I don't think it's fair that there are certain, you know, restrictions you have, so to speak on social media or whatever it is. What's your take there? Well, it's it's a real challenge for the industry and, and for you know gun owners in particular. Um, you, know, you have got um, a bias in the media. You have a uh, bias against the Second Amendment in, in all of these social media platforms. So, for example, your local gun store uh, can't advertise on Facebook. Um, they can't run ads through Google. Uh, they can't run ads on Twitter simply because they're in the lawful commerce of firearms and ammunition products which is of course a constitutionally protected activity. Um, you see people, you know, where they're attacked if they post pictures of firearms. There was a student at Fordham University recently who posted a picture of a brand new AR uh, and got, you know, suspended from school because of that. And you know, exercising First Amendment rights had nothing to do with the campus or the school. Um, so, you, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. And on the hunting side, you see, you know, the radical, um, anti-hunting animal rights groups uh, attack, you know, you, you see it all the time. Somebody posts a picture of an of a animal they've harvested in a lawful hunt 
particularly if it's a hunt in Africa, you know, they just uh, viciously attack you know, people for, um, you know, in involving themselves in a lawful activity. Again, particularly if it's Africa, I mean, they, you know, uh, and people don't realize this, but, you know, Af you know, African countries are dependent upon hunting. It's an important part of their economy. It's an important part of how, you know, and they manage their wildlife. They, you know, hunting is in Africa and all across the United States in the world is a critical wildlife management tool. It's the number one wildlife management tool. But the you know groups like PETA and the Humane Society of the United States, which is not your local dog shelter, they've got nothing to do with your local dog shelter. They make you think they do because of their name, but they're just a hardcore animal rights anti-hunting organization. So and now given given animal rights, there that's why we have rules and regulations in terms of hunting. Right. They're all based right. around animal rights. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. You know what I mean? They see hunting and it's unfortunate because it, like we're talking about, we're talking about education here. And if right. a lot of people were educated on the protocols and what the rules are, you know, I go hunting in South Carolina and turkey hunting yeah. and there's rules and regulations we follow, Absolutely. like very strict, very stringent. And that's part of the whole humanity to this, right. along with harvesting your animal, eating your animal and things like that, you know, different principles that are fundamental for, I mean, in my opinion, for us as Americans. Yeah, well, you know, it's ethical hunting, right? There are seasons um, and bag limits all to protect wildlife. And, you know, um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Hunters are the original conservation movement, right? I mean, no one cares more about conservation and wildlife than hunters. Uh, and for a lot of uninformed people, that seems um, counterintuitive, but it's the truth. I mean, the industry pays the Pittman-Robertson excise tax on firearms and ammunition products, and that's the primary source of wildlife conservation funding in the United States. Hunters pay license fees and tags and you know, duck stamps and such, all that goes to fund wildlife conservation. And not just game animals, but non-game species as well, as well as habitat that gets enjoyed by, you know, non-consumptive uses. People who just go bird watching or hiking benefit from, you know, the, the industry and hunters paying these taxes and supporting conservation. Topics, and we touched on a lot today. And there's so much to NSSF than just firearms. It, you can't yeah. just blanketly say, okay, there's a gun. Let's just talk about the gun. There's a lot that goes into what a firearms, like the whole industry has to deal with the safety. It's, it's regulation. everything legal yeah. regulation. So Larry, I really appreciate coming on and shining a light more on what NSSF is doing and not just the shot show. There's way more behind it. Yeah. Well, you know, shot show is like one week, but you know, it's a full-time job, but it is, you know, what helps to support all the other things that we do on the policy side, you know, lobbying to protect Second Amendment in the industry and, and all of the initiatives we do, like Project Child Safe and Fix Nicks. And my dog is getting restless, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, Larry, I appreciate you coming on today. Thank Pleasure. you, Larry.